Hello. So this lecture is going to be a very long one because I'm going to do all of the skin in one unit, but that doesn't mean that you can't stop and pause and go back and do stuff like that. I just thought this would be simpler. So today's lecture is about the skin. So we'll start with an overview, then we'll go into the general functions of the skin, go through the anatomy so we can understand how the skin works, and then we'll talk about some of the features, so including skin color, the appendages of the skin, which include sweat glands and hair, Another feature of the skin is also the, or another appendage of the skin are also the fingernails, but we won't be cover the, covering those in this class. Then we will end this unit by talking about some of the pathologies associated with skin. So this includes skin cancer and then also burns. So starting out, we're gonna take an overview of the integumentary system. So the integumentary system is roughly 7% of our total body mass, and it is composed of two layers. So this includes the epidermis. Epi means over, so epidermis, so over the dermis, which then explains why I called the epidermis, because the layer below that is called the dermis, which is the thicker layer of the skin. So epidermis means over skin, and it's composed of a tissue type that we've seen in lab already. So this is keratinized stratified squamous epithelium. And so what I'd like you to think about before we go to the next slide is what does the fact that the epidermis is an epithelial tissue tell us about the, its level of vascularization? So I'll give you a second to think about that. And if you want to, you can pause, but then I will go on. So the answer is we know that because it's epithelial, all epithelial tissue is avascular, which again means no blood vessels. second layer going in is the dermis. So this is the inner layer, and because it's not forming a border, it's a connective tissue, and this is composed of a couple of types of fibrous connective tissue. So fibrous connective tissue. And we'll break those two down in a few minutes. Because it's connective tissue, and it needs to support the overlying epidermis, which is avascular, the dermis is heavily vascularized, which is one of the reasons we bleed when we injure ourselves. But this vascularity allows the nutrients to be passed to the nutrients, passed to epidermis through diffusion. The third layer, and this is not actually a com necessarily considered a part of the integumentary system, but we're going to talk about it now just because it's so closely associated with it, is the hypodermis. The hypodermis is this area down below the dermis, and it's composed primarily of fat. So it stores adipose tissue. And a function is to loosely anchor the skin to the underlying tissue. anchor skin. Underlying tissue, which when we dissect the cats, which will be starting next week, you will see that this is mostly muscle tissue. Okay, with that, we've sort of introduced the broad structures of the integumentary system. So now we're going to go through what are some of the functions that it does. And this is just a list. We're going to go through each of these independently. It basically protects, regulates temperature, allows us to sense the outside environment, is responsible for some metabolic processes, 
creates a blood res reservoir and is also a source of excretion. So in terms of protection, the integumentary system forms a physical barrier, which again is through its stratified squamous epithelium, which is the strongest and thickest of the epithelial membranes, stratified squamous epithelium. In addition to a physical barrier, the skin also forms a chemical barrier in the form of an acid mantle. which we learned about acid is very bad for proteins, potentially causing denaturation. And so because of that, it will also kill small organisms. And so these acids are organic acids produced by the body. And they basically form an inhospitable environment for bacteria. These come from sweat glands in the form of amino acids. And then fatty acids, which are in the phospholipids, both of which will lower the pH. And then the third and final protection barrier are the, is a biological barrier. And this create, is created by the immune system, which we will cover more in depth in the second component of the course. And the cells, which we will talk about in a minute, are the epidermal dendritic cells. Second function of the integumentary system is temperature regulation, as it is the primary interaction between our inside of our body and the outside of our body. And so to regulate temperature, one thing that's probably the first thing that comes to your mind is sweating. So sweat allows us to cool the body through evaporative cooling. Evaporative cooling. Second way is through regulation of blood flow to the skin. So blood flow to the surface. And so if you vasoconstrict, so close off your blood, blood vessels, vasoconstrict, this helps us maintain heat. If you vasodilate, which opens up the blood vessels, bringing blood up close to the surface, then we can lose heat to the environment. This picture here is just a lizard that's regulating its temperature. It uses a strategy on hot sand where it minimizes contact with the sand to sort of allow itself to cool off. So what I'd like you to think about for a second is what are the things that you can feel through your skin? So basically, what are the sensations that you're able to detect? And so if you want to pause, again, this is good to think through this yourself because then you won't, if you've gone through that process internally, then it will make it much easier if I ask you a question like this on the test. But basically there are four things that we can detect. So we can detect heat, we can detect cold, we can detect pain, and we can detect touch. And to do this, we use specific receptors. We will talk more about sensory receptors later in the semester, later in the, this class. So temperature, both heat and cold, is detected by a class of receptor called a thermoreceptor. And different receptors are involved in heat and cold, which is why I'm separating them out. Pain is detected by a nociceptor. Touch through mechanoreceptors. Basically, it's describing the specific stimulus that's activating a receptor that then sends a signal to the brain, central nervous system, to then elicit a response. In terms of touch, we are able to detect two different levels, so we can detect both light touches as one, one receptor system and then harder bumps with a different system.
and we will be coming back to those later when we talk about the nervous system. Okay, the fourth function of skin is to make a vitamin D precursor. So this is its metabolic function. So it's basically an interaction between cholesterol and ultraviolet light converts it into this precursor. Vitamin D is critical for our health because we need vitamin D to be able to absorb calcium through our intest intestinal wall. Needed to absorb calcium. And the reason for having this picture of tan lines is that really the vitamin D precursor needs to be exposed to ultraviolet light. One of the things that explains color differences, skin color differences between human populations is as you move further from the equator where there's less sunlight, you need to remove the pigment in your skin that absorbs the ultraviolet light, which is also damaging, to allow you to make vitamin D. And we will come back to that in a second when we talk about skin color. The fifth function of the integumentary system is to function is to act as a blood reservoir, and up to five percent of the body's blood can be held in the intake, in the dermal layer of the skin. Which then can move out of the skin when we have a change in metabolic need, such as if you start exercising or if you eat a large meal, blood can then be pulled out of the integumentary system back into the rest of the body to then supply muscles or, or digestive system with increased blood flow. So returns to body when needed. Now in the sixth function of the integumentary system is excretion. So this is where body can get rid of primarily waters and salts in the form of so water and salts when we sweat, but we also lose small amounts of nitrogenous waste, which is the metabolic byproduct of digesting protein. Small So on this page, there's a link for a video, which is actually a pretty good sum summary of some of the functions and ways that the skin works. It's a little bit hokey, and it's kind of funny because the way that they show sort of, or don't show any of this person in the videos uh, considered private parts. But if you want a break, that's a good video to watch. Okay, we will now start going through the anatomy of the integumentary system, starting with the outer epidermis. So again, at the epidermis is composed of keratinized stratified squamous epithelium. And we're going to start out by talking through what are the cells that you find in the epidermis. So the majority of cells, so all of these cells, basically in the orangish tan color, are keratinocytes. And we will go through each of these and what they're doing in a second. The second most common are the melanocytes. Which are only found down at the bottom of the epidermis. And then third most common are these purple cells, which is a dendritic cell, part of the immune system. And then occasional tactile cells, which are also called Merkel cells. And just to orient you, this little pinkish color is a little bit of dermis sticking up into this picture. So starting out with the keratinocytes, again, these are the majority of cells of the 
for myself. And they get their name because they produce keratin. Indeed. Which is a fibrous protein. One of the things that's interesting about keratinocytes is that as you add friction to the outside of the stratified squamous epithelium or outside of the epidermis, this accelerates the rate of division. So cell division and also keratinization. So basically, if you're exposing an area of skin to the friction, it's going to start dividing faster and start making more keratin. And so if this keeps going, this is what turns into calluses. So that's only if it's a long-term exposure to friction. So second type of cell we're going to talk about are the melanocytes. So melanocytes are only found in the deepest layer. And what they do is produce melanin in membrane-bound packets. And what these packets are called or is equals is a melanosome. So if you have a packet, we pretend this red color is brown, so that would be melanin. And what the cells do is make these little packets and transfer them over to the neighboring keratinocytes. keratinocytes. And what they do is accumulate. So if we have a keratinocyte here with its nucleus, these melanosomes get transported into the keratinocyte and accumulate above the nucleus to help shield the nucleus from U ultraviolet light. So here you have ultraviolet light and the melanosomes creating a protective layer. So this is a keratinocyte nucleus. Third type of cell that we find in the epidermis are the dendritic cells, which again are these immune cells. And what their function is, is to activate an immune response. So they're basically sentinels looking for some sort of invading pathogen that if they find one, will then go recruit the rest of the immune system. They also play a role in directly ingesting foreign substances. So ingest foreign substances. And to carry out their function, basic structure of a cell is, so if this is a cell body, it basically is living between the keratinocytes, sending out these projections that look for invadive, potential invaders. Fourth type of cell are the tactile cells, or Merkel cells, and basically they're just sensory receptors for touch. So we now need to talk through the layers of the epidermis. And so if you have thick skin, which you find on the palms of your hands and on the bottom of your feet, there's five layers. So thick skin has five layers. Whereas thin skin, which you find on most of the rest of the body, is going to have four layers. And you'll notice the word stratum, stratum equals layer. So whenever you hear 
basically like stratification means that there's multiple separation of layers. Stratum is comes from that same root. So starting out with the bottom layer. So this is the stratum basali. Stratum basali is a single row of rapidly dividing keratinocytes. So this is basically creating the new keratinocytes and then pushing them up. So there's this migration of keratinocytes going up towards the surface, losing cell volume, transforming as they go out towards the apical layer. So you also have about 10 to 25 percent of the cells found in the stratum basali are melanocytes. And the 25% towards the melanocytes. And then occasionally you will have a, a tactile cell. Occasional tactile cell. So the second layer of the epidermis is called the stratum spinosum. So it's called this because the cells in this layer look spiny. They are not actually spiny, but the way that they get cut for histology creates this space. And we'll talk about that, where that comes from in a second. But this layer is, so stratum spinosum is this layer here. Typically is several, several cell layers thick. And in this layer, you start getting the pre-keratin fibers. So basically, the cells are getting ready to start making kerat keratin. So pre-keratin fibers form. What happens is that these fibers anchor to desmosomes, which we talked about earlier when we talked about cell biology. So basically, it's proteins in the cell surface that allow interaction between neighboring cells. And so when you have this happen, it then joins neighboring cells. And so histologically what happened is they cut the cell and the desmosomes, which let's see if I'll just do two cells. Desmosomes, which I will color green or out at the end of these projections, as you cut through the blade, the tissue tears in a lot of this region and disappears. And so then what it looks like in histology is a layer of spiny shaped cells. These are the cells that in the stratum spinosum that contain the melanin granules that contain So again, these are the keratinocytes that have been picking up the melanin granules from the melanocytes, which are in the stratum basali. And this is also the layer where these dendritic cells are found. So it contains highest density for dendritic cells. third layer is the stratum granulosum. And this is typically four to six layer cells thick. In this layer, this is where keratinization actually begins. So you've got the pre-keratin granules from the stratum spinosum and the stratum granulosum. You actually get keratinization occurring keratinization begins. You also get water resistance developing. So H2O resistance 
This is because there's glycolipids, so what sugar, fat granules that are getting secreted and coating the cells. The membrane itself gets thicker, also because of the glycolipid granules, making it a stronger, sort of more physical protective barrier. And then because the cell is starting to actually die at this point, organelles and nucleus will disintegrate. And what this does is makes the stratum granulosum the last living, last living layer. And that's largely because water resistance has occurred and it prevents diffusion. So if you can't move water, you can't carry nutrients. And so then the t cells that are beyond that waterproof layer are gonna all die. The fourth layer, and this is the one that's only present in thick cells, is the stratum muslin. It's called that because it usually histologically looks very clear, transparent, so it's almost like light shining through it. This is only two to three layers thick. Two to three cell layers thick. And during this, in this layer, just keratinization continues. And then that brings us to the outer thickest layer of the epidermis, which is the stratum corneum. This layer is 20 to 30 cells thick. And this is where fully mature keratin is present. So keratin is present, which helps create a very abrasion resistant layer. So it's abrasion resistant. The glycolipids have made it waterproof, which if you put a drop of water in your skin, you'll see it sort of bulb, bulb up or form a droplet. It's not, diff not getting moved across the skin. So it's waterproof. And this is this conveyor belt of cells sort of constantly dividing from the stratum basali, migrating up to the spinosum granulosum, out to the corneum, and then being released off of the stratum corneum. And over our lifetime, we lose about 40 pounds worth of keratinocytes off of that surface. So 40 pounds slough off over life. Which, if you don't have pets, is supposed to account for most of the dust that you find in your house. In my house with a dog and a cat, we have a lot of dust just being transported in, especially since my dog is basically a living mop. Okay, now we're ready to talk about the second layer of the skin, which is the deeper layer, the dermis. The dermis is composed of two layers as well, or not two layers as well, but composed of two layers. So there's the outer surface layer, closer to the surface, called the papillary layer. And then deep to that and thicker is the reticular layer. So we combine these form the dermis. So starting with the papillary layer, this is the superficial layer. and it is composed of areolar connective tissue, which if you remember from lab is the loose connective tissue allowing blood vessels to pass through it, which is, so this is where a lot of the capillary beds in our skin are found. And the name papillary layer comes from the fact 
that it forms these papilla. So papilla are little projections. If you imagine this is a three-dimensional sheet, this looks kind of like that egg carton foam that you sometimes get things packed into. So these are indents into the epidermis. And this is just another picture of this showing papillary layer, again, just being from here to here with these papilla coming up from indents up into the epidermis. Here you can see the stratum lucidum, which tells us what type of skin we're looking at. Which is, so this is an example of thick skin. The deeper layer is the reticular layer, so this is deep, and it is composed of dense irregular connective tissue. Which is from, again, from lab, densely packed collagen fibers crisscrossing multiple directions. And it's actually collagen fiber bundles. So what I'd like to talk about next is some of the features that, the, that we have on our skin or that we have on our skin because of the, fe the structures of primarily the dermis. So the first thing are friction ridges. So what we're looking at in this picture is a fingerprint. Could be a toe print, I guess. Basically, something that you only find on the palms of your hands and the bottom of your feet. And these are caused by sort of larger ridges in the underlying dermis. And what they do is increase our ability to grip a surface. So increase, increase grip, and they're also thought to enhance our sense of touch. And so again, as I said, these are found palms of hands, soles of feet, and are really what we think of as fingerprints. The second feature that develops because of the dermis are cleavage lines, and these are thin areas between collagen bundles. And so what you see, so these red lines on this person over on the left side represent where the cleavage lines are. So they, you can see they tend to be longitudinal on the head versus horizontal or transverse in the neck and torso. And then longitudinal again on the legs. And why these are significant is that surgically, it is much better if you're going to go in and open up a person's body to look for, like, removing, let's say, you want to do something on the stomach. So stomach is located up here. You want to do a lateral incision or transverse incision to go in between those collagen bundles so that when you stitch it back up together, it repairs much faster. Whereas if you do a perpendicular cut, those bundles are going to be split and they don't repair very quickly. So helps with surgery, so knowledge helps with surgery and it allows parallel cuts heal faster. The last of the features from the dermis that I want to talk about are the flexure lines. And these are deep folds in the dermis that you find at joints. So 
So if you're looking at the picture of the hand, the flexor lines are basically all the creases that you see in the palm or between the, knuck between the knuckles, the joints of the phalanges are all flexor lines. And what they do is anchor the dermis to the deep structures. So we find on palm, knuckles, soles of feet. So if you have a layer of epidermis here, you have the dermis coming down, making a deep fold, and then it's anchoring itself onto a joint. So this is the anchor onto a bone. And so what that does is prevent the overlying skin from sliding. sliding of skin. And a good way to illustrate this is if you put your hand, one fingers from one hand on the palm of your other hand and try and move the skin around, it doesn't really move. If you do the same thing on your forearm, you can slide it around. You can explore various spots of your body. So like on the elbow, there's some movement on the outside, less movement on the inside. It just depends where you are. Soles of your feet, there's almost no movement. So because you don't want your skin on your feet to slide off your body when you stop. So it can be really gross looking. Okay, now next topic is going to be skin color. So we're going to start out with the primary pigment that's produced in the skin and then some other pigments that are actually derived elsewhere. So starting out with melanin. So melanin, melanin is the only pigment made in skin it's a polymer of the amino acid tyrosine and is formed by the enzyme. So this is the enzyme tyrosine tyrosinase. It doesn't sound quite right. Tyrosinase. And there's two varieties that you find in human populations. So there's theomelanin, which confers a reddish brown, reddish yellow color. Which I found a picture of some mice that illustrates this. So this is a mouse that's rich in theomelanin, whereas eumelanin confers a brownish black color. And so this picture illustrates sort of a individual rich in eumelanin, and then sort of a mixture of theomelanin And then this woman has almost no melanin in her face. And so then, and then I just like the picture of the gradient of tigers. So melanin, again, cre is created by melanocytes that then transfer these melanin granules, melanosomes, over to keratinocytes. And so melanin is only present in the deep layers of the skin or epidermis. And as melanin, the cells, the keratinocytes containing melanin migrate up towards the cell apical surface of the epithelial layer, they get broken down by lysosomes. So digested by lysosomes, which are those digestion organelles found in the keratinocytes. So this is why melanin disappears before it gets up to the apical surface of the skin, epidermis. So all humans have the same approximate number of melanocytes, give or, give or take some biological variation, but what accounts for skin levels, colors, Skin color differences is not the number of melanocytes, but it is the type of melanin that's being produced and then the level of melanin that's being expressed. So melanin type. And 
level of expression. So function of melanin is to absorb UV and dissipate that energy as heat absorbs UV energy and dissipates as heat. And again, there's melanin granules, melanosomes, form a UV shield over the superficial side of the keratinocyte nucleus, especially down near the stratum basali where those cells are dividing rapidly. The UV exposure will actually cause the keratinocytes to stimulate melanocyte activity, so it turns on the melanocytes to make more melanosomes. And so basically what this means is the if when somebody becomes darker skinned after sun exposure, it's because there's increased DNA repair. So basically skin damage leads to more melanocytes, more melanocyte activity. Melanocyte activity stimulated by DNA damage and repair. And then what that does is darkens the skin. which is what we call tanning. So what happens if you don't have melanin or if basically you have too much sun exposure is you have clumping of the elastin fibers in the skin, primarily in the dermal layer. Dermal elastin fibers, which makes the skin leather, leathery. You can develop skin cancer, which is a genetic mutation in the keratinocytes or some of the cells of the epidermis primarily. And then some one function that's actually most harmful to women that are pregnant is that it destroys the fol folic acid in their body. And without folic acid, then the nervous system of a developing fetus doesn't occur properly. For fetal development. And what I find interesting is this picture here, is this is a truck driver. And you can see he was driving, this is the side of his face that was facing outside of the truck, driving with his window open. This is inside, and he's been doing it enough that basically his skin turned leathery on one side and not so leathery on the side that was protected from the sun. Okay, with that, we are done talking about melanin, and we're going to talk about keratin, which is not created in the skin. So keratin is a yellow-orange pigment that's found in some plants carrots and squashes primarily and what it does is accumulates in the stratum corneum and hypodermis. And so you can actually see it show up in your skin. It's most visible in areas of thick skin because that's where the stratum corneum is thickest. So the palms of your hands and soles of your feet it is not harmful, so keratin is converted into vitamin A by the body, which is needed for vision and skin health. And this can happen for people that eat a lot of carrots. My dad at one point became a big fan of carrots and actually started to turn orange in his hands. The last of the pigments that you can see in the skin is hemoglobin, which again is not created in the skin itself. So hemoglobin, which we'll be talking about at the beginning of the second portion of the course, is a oxygen transporting pigment that's found in blood cells and it circulates through the dermal capillaries within those red blood cells, the erythrocytes, and is only visible or most visible in individuals that have less melanin in their skin to sort of allow that red color to get up through the, 
through the keratinocyte so you can actually see the dermal layer. Cyanosis is a condition where the skin appears blue due to poorly oxygenated blood, allowing medical professionals to assess a patient's potential pathologies. It is a sign of heart failure or respiratory distress. And you can detect it in, it's most easily detected in light-skinned individuals, but you can see it in dark-skinned individuals, primarily in their mucous membranes, so inside their mouth, or in the nail beds, so under their fingernails or toenails. With that, we're ready to talk about some of the appendages of the skin. So this includes the pseudoriferous and sebaceous glands, which are the sweat glands. And then we'll talk a little bit about hair, but again, no fingernails. So the first of the sweat glands we'll talk about are the eccrine glands. These are our neurocrine glands, which means that they release or secrete their substance or secretion, create their secretion through exocytosis. These are also coiled tubular glands. So they basically coil up like a snake and they're found at the base of the dermis. Functionally, the eccrine glands are involved in thermoregulation, so they produce sweat that helps prevent overheating. Based on your own experiences, where on your body do you think most of your eccrine glands are located? So, Eccrine glands are located primarily anywhere where you think of getting sweaty when you get hot, which includes the palms of your hands, the soles of your feet, and your forehead. Second type of sweat pseudoriferous gland that we'll talk about are the apocrine sweat glands. These are found in the armpit region, so the axillary region, and the anogenital region, which is basically your groin area. These are very similar to the eccrine glands, only they are larger and deeper than the eccrine glands, and they produce a secretion that is richer in lipids rich secretion, which means that they provide food for bacteria. Which then results in odor. So these are apocrine sweat glands become more active once you hit puberty, once an individual hits puberty. And so some of their role is thought to actually produce pheromone, which is that we have evolved to sort of attract mates. The last two forms of pseudoriferous gland that we'll talk about is the serominous glands, which produce earwax. Earwax is thought to help deter insects and trap dust. Serum, serum or earwax is bitter, which is where it's why it's supposed to be unattractive to insects. But you can see here in this picture, this is looking into somebody's external ear canal. You can see a spider looking back out, so it does not always work. The last of the sweat glands, pseudoriferous glands we'll talk about is the mammary gland, which produces milk. And we will go into more details of mammary glands when we talk about the reproductive system in the second portion of the course. The second type of gland that I'd like to talk about is the sebaceous glands. Sebaceous glands are located at the roots of hairs. And they are simple alveolar glands.
feelings are alveolar, alveolus, alveolar gland has this sort of uh, triangle shaped base. They secrete sebum. So the secretion from the sebaceous gland is known as sebum. And it produces this through, holo, through a holocrine process, which we talked about last time, is the process of the cells actually rupturing. Sebum is thought to be involved in maintaining hair health and also functioning as a bacteria side, helping keep bacteria from growing there. Uh, oops. Hair health and And so when a sebaceous gland gets infected is when what we call a pimple. So the last of the appendages we're going to talk about, skin appendages, is hair. So the last of the appendages we're going to talk about is hair, covers most of our body. Functionally, hair senses insects before they can have a chance to bite, bite us. So they sense insects crawling on our skin. It is also thought to have evolved, particularly the hair on the top of our head, but also on our eyebrows and other parts of our body to help attract mates. And then finally, hair has a role in insulation. Although in humans, we've mostly evolved to move away from that function. So the hair is composed primarily of dead keratinized cells that are produced down in the hair follicle. So here we're looking at a cross section of the hair. This is the epidermis up here. So most of the hair is down into the dermal layer. And what you have is the hair above the epidermis is called the shaft. The root of the hair is the portion of the hair below the epidermis. And then it gets down into this little box, the bottom of the hair, which is a hair follicle. Looking at a cross section of the hair, there's three regions. So there's an inner medulla. is filled with air spaces. So there's a cortex, which is forming this bulky outer layer of several cells. And then a cuticle layer which is an outer layer of overlapping cells. Over on the right side, this is actually the same, same image, only in a histogram or a histology sample. So this is actually a microscope image. But you can see basically the shaft of the hair in the middle. So some anatomy for this. So here we're looking at a cross section of the hair bulb. So this is the follicle wall. That we're looking at. And outside of the hair is the peripheral connective sheath. Connective sheath, which is composed or found in the dermis, created by the dermis. Next layer is a thickened basal lamina called the glassy membrane is this purple line. So that's a thickened basal lamina. And then finally we've got this epithelial root sheet. which is created by an invagination of the epidermis.
for uh, indentation. So some other anatomy, we're now looking at the bottom of the root bulb. There's a hair matrix, which is this, these cells right here, which are the dividing keratinocytes that basically produce the hair. And then similar to what we found in the skin, you also have melanocytes, which are producing the hair color. Because each hair functions as a small sensory touch amplifier, each hair follicle is innervated. So here's the basically nerve fibers coming in and wrapping around the hair follicle. And so what this allows is each hair is very sensitive to being touched. Movement or touch. And what this nerve fiber is called is a hair follicle receptor. Associated with each hair follicle is a muscle called the erector pili. This is a smooth muscle that helps raise the hair up. So this is helps when you get cold or if you get goosebumps, the erector pili is contracting, elevating the hair. Or if you get startled, if you think of a cat getting scared, the erector pili is what pulls those hair hair follicles, it's pulling the pulling on the base of the hair follicle, making the hair stand straight out. Last thing that I wanted to talk about with hair was the hair growth cycle. So hair growth cycle is basically this process with which one hair follicle becomes active, so it synthesizes hair and then regresses and regenerates itself. So typically a hair grows at about two and a half millimeters a week. That's not very, very far. And the gro growth cycle is the period of time at which the hair matrix is active and dividing. At the end of the cycle, it then regresses and the hair falls out. So when you see hair falling, hair in your shower that's come out of your head, it's because that hair has hit the end of its growth cycle. The cycle length is what defines the length of the hair. So if you look at the scalp, like in this girl, hair, the hair cycle is about six to 10 years, which is why our scalp hair is so long. Whereas in the eyebrows, the hair cycle typically is three to four months. which as you get older, the hair cycle gets longer in your eyebrows. And so then that's why some people get bushy eyebrows. Okay, last two things, and this will be fairly fast on skin, are some pathologies. So we're gonna start out by talking about skin cancer. So there's three types that we'll cover, basal cell carcinoma, squamous cell carcinoma, and melanoma. Basal cell carcinoma is a cancer that starts in the stratum basali. And these cells, a cancer cell is basically cells dividing out of control. And so the cells proliferate. And invade the dermis and hypodermis. So basically go into areas hypo that they're not supposed to be. Path, uh, Phenotypically or symptom-wise, what you see are these shiny red, shiny domed nodules. And although these are fairly visible cancers, they're typically, because they are so visible, you catch them early, and so that they're rarely malignant, 
destiny that they tend not to be that dangerous. And this is a histological image showing, here you can see epidermis, so the stratum basali is right there. Here you can see the cells from the stratum basali invading the underlying dermal layer. And so this would be a sign of a cancer. Second type of cancer we'll talk about is squamous cell carcinoma. These are the uh, cancer of the keratinocytes in the stratum spinosum. what it shows up as is scaly red reddened papillae. Scaly reddened and this is a more dangerous type of cancer so it tends to grow rapidly once it starts to develop and becomes and then can metastasize which as soon as a cancer cell metastasizes meaning that it moves to another part of the body can be very dangerous So this is again, since we're studying histology in lab, image of the cancer. And here you can see again, this is the epidermis up in the darker purple. And the cancer is this ingrowth of cells from the stratum, sp stratum spinosum growing down into the underlying dermis. Last of the cancers that we're going to talk about is a melanoma. And this is luckily a fairly rare form of cancer. And what it's caused by it is transformed melanocytes. Transformation is the process of a normal cell becoming cancerous. And of the three, this is the most deadly meaning that if you get it, this is most likely to actually cause some serious problems. And it does this because it is very metastatic. So likely to leave the skin and migrate to someplace like a bone or your brain or your lungs and start dividing there. The reason that cancers kill you tend to be because it actually disrupts the epithelial membrane and then allows basically no longer create, allows that epithelial membrane to function as a functional barrier. And then here's a picture of a melanocyte. This one is actually the easiest of these three to identify because you can see this brown pigment of the melanosomes and that's migrating down out of the stratum basali where it should be found down into the underlying dermis. Okay, last thing we'll talk about is burns. So most of you have probably encountered different degrees of burns. So we'll go through what are each of those degrees. A first degree burn is the least harmful. It occurs only in the epidermis. And because it's superficial to the underlying dividing keratinocytes, it heals rapidly. So if we have our, this is, epidermis, here's our dermis, and then the hypodermis, a first degree burn is one that will not make it all the way through the epidermis, but burn out the, or kill the outer epidermis, but leave those underlying cells to continue to divide. Second category burn is a uh, second degree burn is a burn that covers both the epidermis and dermis.
And what it leads to is blistering. So basically a separating of the dermis from the underlying, overlying epidermis. And so if we have, again, epidermis, dermis, hypodermis, you get a burn, comes down, eliminates this, the two layers, and then causes basically an air-filled separation between the top layer and the bottom layer. These are very painful and take a little bit, take longer to heal because you've now eliminated those stem keratinocytes that are redivide, recreating the skin layer. And then the last of the categories is the third degree burn. Third degree burn removes the full thickness of the skin. And even though it's very dangerous, it's not painful because you've also eliminated all the nerve fibers. But it's dangerous because the skin is lost now as a barrier in that region. So if I draw that out again, here's our skin, epidermis, dermis, hypodermis, third degree burn is one that's gonna basically take out the whole integumentary system. The risks from burns, so basically this is going in order of how you would die from a burn. First thing is that because of the loss of the barrier, you're gonna lose fluid very rapidly out through that, that spot or through the damaged area. So dehydration is the primary concern initially. And so if you want to treat that person, you then need to give them liquids and electrolytes to make sure that they're not dehydrating. If you survive the dehydration, the next thing that happens is your body starts to repair itself. It's epidermis, so it wants to repair itself quickly. It's very important that it repairs itself quickly, so it will dedicate so much nutrition, so many nutrients towards that repair that basically you go beyond your ability to ingest it and you can starve. So. Starvation, so too much nutrient requirement. And then the last thing is after probably three or four days, so this would be like the first 24 hours. This is probably the next, let's say two to five days is as your body burns through its nutrients, the last thing that would kill you would be from an infection because you've lost that barrier and so then bacteria start to invade, and so then you have immune problems. And so you would, to treat that, you would put the patient on antibiotics. And with that, we are done with skin. I realize this is a long lecture, but I wanted to combine the two. I will try and break up the future systems. So, but, and this is the last of the content for exam one.